I'm Pastor Jeremy Kopik, and this is the Bible Fellowship for August 22nd and 23rd, the weekend of August 22 and 23. In 1 Samuel chapter 13, the Bible talks about how God's people were hiding, and they were distressed, and they were trembling because of the Philistines. But then enter Jonathan. Jonathan comes in and really breathes courage into God's people. He and his armor bearer went and defeated a garrison of the Philistines, and Israel desperately needed a champion that day in Jonathan. Sometime later, you have in 1 Samuel chapter 17, the, in, the intimidation of Goliath, this, this big-mouthed bully from Gath. And then you've got David who enters, and David's the one who hears this, and he says, this is a real problem. This is, there's a cause here, and we have to do something about this guy and the talk that he was bringing to Israel as he was blaspheming and cursing God and cursing God's people. And so in both instances, you've got a situation where people are really discouraged, and people are really afraid, and they're really distressed, but God sends a champion. I want to talk to you about being able. In fact, I want to say to you, be Abel. And as we look together today in a fairly familiar passage in Judges chapter 6, and we won't tell the whole story of Gideon because there's so much about Gideon, but the, Gideon's um, uh, episodes, they begin in Judges chapter 6. And as you get into Judges chapter 6, the Bible begins to tell a familiar story because of their sin, the Lord had delivered Israel into bondage under the Midianites for seven years. This was a very normal cycle in the book of Judges where God's people have fallen into sin and it's not going well for them. They, um, they, they, they fall back into bondage for a few years. Uh, some of these things were tribal. Some of these things were nationwide. But the bottom line is these people were in a lot of trouble with the Midianites. And the Bible says in verse 2 of Judges chapter 6 that the Midianites, were, they were very hard in Israel and they were they were oppressing them and as a result the Israelites hid in dens and in the mountains and in caves and in the stronghold of the fortresses they were hiding out from the Midianites and the Midianites plundered them they ruined their crops they killed their animals took their animals um, and their uh, their livestock and Israel basically had nothing left because of the way that the Midianites had been treating them and the bondage that they uh, uh, had suffered the Bible is very clear in its wording in both verses 1 and 6 in Judges chapter 6. In fact, let me read verse 6. Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites, and the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. It was in verse 1 that the Bible said that the Lord had given them over. He had delivered them over to the Midianites. Please understand that our hardships are designed by God. If your life is hard today, you have to know that God is working. You have to know that God is designing those things in my life and in your life to teach us to pray to the Lord. God had allowed Israel to fall back into bondage. And you can just, I, I just, when I hear stories like this from the Bible, I sometimes scratch my head and I think, this is just, is so wrong for God's people to be in bondage. In the same way that Jonathan was frustrated by it and that David was frustrated by it, we should be frustrated by it. That God's people would have hardship or bondage, not because hard times don't make us stronger, that's all good stuff, but it's because bondage implies that something's not right between us and God, that we are enslaved by those who don't love the Lord. And so the hardship of Israel was exactly that. They were enslaved by people that really plundered them, made life so difficult for them, and really is because they hadn't been serving the Lord. In fact, in Judges chapter 6, verses 7 through 10, God sends a prophet, an unnamed prophet to them, and that prophet says basically this. He said, you guys got to know, God has already delivered you before out of bondage. You want to you talk about this? Glad you're praying. Glad you're frustrated. Glad you want to talk to God. But you got to know that God has already delivered Israel out of bondage. And God told you when he delivered you from Egypt and when he sent you to the promised land, God told you not to give yourselves over to the gods of the Amorites, but you did. You did exactly what God told you not to do, and you disobeyed. And this is why you find yourself in the jam that you are in today. That's verse 10. Now, verse 11, enter Gideon. This is the first time we hear about Gideon. And we find Gideon in verse 11 hiding. He's hiding. 
The Bible says he's over here at a, at a, um, a, a threshing floor, and he's there, um, uh, and the angel of the Lord appears to him as he's there under an oak there, uh, uh, threshing wheat, at a, basically at a wine press, and um, uh, where you would not have expected him to be threshing, he'd get kind of his makeshift threshing floor, and he's hiding. Why, why is he doing this? He's hiding because of the Midianites. He's hiding, and he doesn't want them to come take his stuff. So he's trying to uh, uh, manufacture and, 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 and get foods and, um, and make things work for his family and for his, his, um, 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 uh, his tribe. And as he does so, he's hiding. And the angel of the Lord comes to him and calls him. He says, Gideon, you're a mighty man of valor. Now, you just, you just have to try to put these verses together. This is why it's really not good to read a verse all by itself, and, but, but, but to step back and verify that you understand the context. So you've got in one verse, you've got Gideon hiding. In the very next verse, the angel of the Lord looks him in the eye and says, man, you're a dude. You are a man of valor. You are, a, a, you are Gideon. In fact, the very name Gideon means one who fells a tree. It was translated all over the Old Testament as mighty man. Basically, he's a big man. His name means warrior, warrior, a, a one who takes big things down. And this is who Gideon is. And so he's standing there and the angel says, yeah, you're Gideon, you're a mighty man. But he was hiding. This was all part of the problem. And it wasn't just that Gideon was hiding. Gideon is not just your everyday Israelite. Gideon was genuinely bothered by the current situation. See, the Bible says in verse 13, Gideon takes off. He says, oh my Lord, if the Lord be with us. So yeah, I don't know if you can see that in your translation, but he says, oh my Lord, which means master. And then he says, if the Lord, all caps, that's Jehovah or Yahweh, if the living God be with us. And so he speaks of God in the third person. And he says, oh my Lord, if Yahweh be with us, then why has all of this befallen us? Gideon says, this does not make sense to me. Why are we struggling? Why is life so hard for God's people? And again, we're not talking about just hardships that make us stronger. We're talking about bondage. And Gideon's like, why am I hiding? Why is it, why is it going so badly for God's people? If we really, if, if our God is the living God, if our God is Yahweh, he says, where be all of his miracles, which our fathers told us of saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? Gideon says, I haven't seen any of that. I haven't seen any of God's bigness, his largeness, his goodness. He says, now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. Gideon says, look, if that's our God, he has turned his back on us. He has forsaken us. Now, please understand, you'd say, well, that guy's stressed out. Yeah, he is. The Bible, literally, he's distressed. But, but you add to that, that they're in a situation that's not right. And while Gideon may not see it perfectly at this point, he does get something right, and that is this. This whole situation is wrong. It's wrong that God's people should cower in the face of those who want to bully them and convince them that their God is small. It's wrong for God's people to live in fear. It's wrong for God's people to be hiding in dens and in caves as if they were, I almost said the word quarantined out loud. What I'm saying to you is this, Gideon was bothered by this. He was absolutely bothered that God's people were hiding. Verse 14, and the Lord says, go in this, in the power, in this your might, for you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites, haven't I sent you? So now the Lord reveals to Gideon, he says, Gideon, I've sent you. You're actually, I'm going to, you do well to be bothered by this because I'm going to use you as the savior. I'm going to use you as the deliverer. And I love the wording as that, as you see it there in verse 14, he says, go in this, your might. It's as if he is saying to Gideon, I called you a mighty man of, of valor and I called you a great man. I called you a warrior. And part of the reason I think that God sees Gideon as a warrior is because Gideon is genuinely, genuinely bothered by the situation. And he says, go in this your might. Yes, that's what we need from you, Gideon. Yes, we like what we hear from you, Gideon. What's coming out of your mouth is exactly the way what should be coming out of your mouth. You're bothered by this, Gideon, and you should be. You're absolutely bothered and good because you're going to need this. This will make you strong 
Gideon, that you are bothered that God's people are hiding. This is not good. It's not good. God's people are not supposed to be hiding. God's people are supposed to be strong. God's people were not created to be disabled, disabled people. God's people were made to be strong. God made us to be able. In verse 15, Gideon says, Oh my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? My family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. So Gideon says, Hey, I, I'm just a little guy. I'm a nobody, actually. I'm a nobody. I think Gideon was scared by what God had just said to him. And the Lord says to him, and by the way, that Gideon saw his family as small and that Gideon saw himself as small. This speaks to the humility of, of Gideon. This is actually a really good thing. And so it's almost like God responds and says, you know what? Good, we can use that too, Gideon. Because in verse 16, the Lord says unto him, surely I will be with you and you shall smite the Midianites as one man. He said, Gideon, I can absolutely use this, your humility. He said, don't you worry. I'm going to be with you. And it will be as if you are, are just you one-to-one, -one, one hand-to-hand combat. You against Midian, you will de defeat them as if they are just one person. Because, because God's going to be with you. The Lord will be with you. Understand something. There's so much more about Gideon. The story, the account of Gideon in the Bible. As you look at this account, you find that, that Gideon was, was um, uh, he really was this, this man of valor, this courageous man. And God uses Gideon and a small army of 300 men to defeat an innumerable host of Midianites. And God uses Gideon for, for one of the, the, the most classic victories in the Bible. As you read the, the, the wars in the Bible and the battles of the Bible, you, you, you are hard pressed to find something so awesome and so dramatic as what God used Gideon to do. God uses him in a marvelous way. And among the things that are just really important for us, as we look at Gideon, it's important for us to, to take away from this account that we should be bothered that God's people are hiding. God never intended for his people to live in hiding. It reminds me, we bumped into this just last week of, of uh, Peter in the book of Mark trying to follow at a distance. And he's following Jesus as a, at a distance when Jesus had been arrested. It was not Peter's finest hour. And frankly, it was gonna get worse before it got better. God's people, it's just, that's just not the way that it's supposed to be. For God's people to be living in hiding, for God's people to be living in, in fear. Let me, let me just bump into a couple of other principles. We cannot possibly be comprehensive, but as we talk about ability, and as we talk about fear, number one, fear is a deterrent to being used by God. In Judges chapter seven and verse three, it's the next chapter. The Lord says to Gideon, whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. I'm, I told you the number will actually get down to 300. But it, when they first came out, there were 32,000 men, which really wasn't enough in the first place from man's count because there were so many Midianites and the, even 32,000 wasn't enough. But God started out and he just said, you know what? He said, you just tell everybody who's afraid they can go home, Gideon. And so while the Lord does not add his commentary on this passage, we look at this and we see, hey, God's going to bring a great victory here. And he starts to thin out the herd and he thins out the herd by sending home everybody that's afraid. Listen, by being afraid, you, you, you hamstring yourself from being used by God. You deter yourself from being used by God. For all those, those men who might have been used that day, this was the first thing. This was the first uh, uh, box to be checked. And they couldn't check this box. And God sent them home because they were afraid. They were afraid of what would happen if they went to battle. And so God sent them home. Secondly, Fear discourages others. It's not just, and maybe that's why God sent them home that day. But the bottom line is in Deuteronomy chapter 20 and verse 8, another battle. What man is there that is fearful and faint-hearted? Let him go and return unto his house, let his, lest his brethren's heart faint as well as his heart. You know, it discourages other people when you're afraid. What else could God do if the people who were afraid would just keep their mouths shut? 
If the people that were afraid would just stop telling everybody how they're afraid. If people who were afraid would get off the social media and stop railing about all the reasons that we have to fear because they've read this, because they've seen that, because they saw this report and they're running around with their fear. And you know what it does? It discourages other people. And before you know it, you've got people, my word, I can imagine a scenario where a whole nation could be trembling because they're listening to fear mongers and people who are winding up the reasons that we should be discouraged and that we should be afraid. Fear discourages other people. By the way, speaking of Joshua, in Joshua chapter 14, Joshua is recounting what had happened with the spies some 40 years earlier when Joshua and Caleb and 10 other men had gone into the Canaan land. And as they had gone in and they came back, and Joshua says in Joshua chapter 14, he says, man, those guys started talking and everybody got discouraged. Everybody just got discouraged because they were afraid because of what these men were saying there. Fear discourages other people. Listen, I'm telling you, love you to death. But if you're afraid, keep your mouth shut. Because God may do something. If those who are afraid would not be winding up the rest of the group, God may do something. Fear discourages others. Number three, God doesn't give us the spirit of fear. He actually empowers us. Now, anybody who knows me knows that I don't spend a lot of time on these empowerment messages. But please understand, as we read the word of God, he really does make us powerful. But it's God who makes us powerful. Remember, this is what, what, what God had said to Gideon. And we saw that in verse 16 a few minutes ago. It's God's presence that would make all the difference in the world. God said, hey, you're humble and you're small in your own sight. That's a great thing because God's presence is exactly what we need. The Bible says God has not given us the, the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. That comes from God. And this was Paul talking to Timothy. And we understand that many times people are afraid, but that fear does not come from God. God actually makes us strong. God actually gives us power. Greek word there is dynamite or dunamis. And the word means that, that it's as if it's a force from God himself. And that comes from God, not the spirit of fear, but rather a spirit of power and a spirit of love and a, and, and a spirit of a sound mind. All of this speaks to our mental health and our mental strength. All of this speaks to what God has given to us rather than the spirit of fear. Number four. God calls you a conqueror in the one who loves us or in the one who loves you. Nay, Paul says, in all these things, we're more than conquerors through him that loved us. It's interesting to me how many times people will put on a t-shirt that says, I survived. I survived the hike up to Mount this or Mount that. I survived a week in the woods. I survived this or that. And you know what? I'm glad that you survived. And I know life's full of precarious situations, but the Bible doesn't call you a survivor. The Bible calls you a conqueror. God calls you more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ, through the one who loves you. In fact, in 2 Peter chapter 1, the Bible is very clear that he, God, has given unto us everything that pertains to life and godliness. God has given to me and to you all of the things that we need in order to live the godly life that he wants us to live. There's no reason for us to live in fear. There's no reason for us to just survive. Ooh, looks like we almost didn't make it. None of that. The fact is God calls us more than conquerors through him that loved us. Number five, God's people should be courageous because he will never leave them. And I remind you what we said about Gideon a moment ago. God's presence is the key to victory. And so here's Gideon, Gideon small in his own sight. And Gideon doesn't think he's this big old great guy. And God says, actually, I can use you, Gideon. You really are a man of valor because you're bothered that God's people live and, and, and cower rather than live strong. You are, you are bothered by that. And if you will trust the Lord by having the Lord, we can be courageous. God will never leave us. This is Moses speaking to Joshua just before Moses died in the next generation of God's people. And Moses said, be strong and of a good courage. Fear not, nor be afraid of them for the Lord your God. He it is that go with you. He will not fail you nor forsake you. And we see, of course, verses like this in the New Testament, which make it very clear. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Speaking of Jesus, 
And it reminds me of these verses in Proverbs chapter 24, 10, for example. If you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. Understand something, God's people. There's no reason for you to faint in the day of adversity. There's no reason for your strength to be small. You draw near to the Lord and be near to Christ. In Jesus Christ, Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You are able. You are not disabled. You are able. God has made you to be strong. God did not make you to be afraid. God did not intend for you to hide. God did not intend for you to fail. God intended for you to be strong. And thus he says, I will be with you. And thus we have the accounts of Jonathan and David and Gideon where God's people are rescued because somebody stood there and said, hey, this is wrong. This is wrong for God's people to be hiding this is, this is the time when God's people should stand up and embrace the cause of the Lord. And God's people should be strong and God's people should be warriors for him. And thus we draw near to Jesus Christ. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Let me ask you just a couple of quick questions. Are you able? What are you doing to live as a conqueror in Jesus Christ? I think about the opportunities to serve that you have, Christian, today. I've heard people say, well, if only I had opportunity. The opportunities are all around you. The opportunities to be a blessing, the opportunities to serve the Lord, the opportunities to use your strengths for the Lord, they're all around you. Are you hiding? Are you showing Christ? Are you sharing Christ? What are the things that make us think that we are powerless? Are we listening to the devil? The Bible says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You don't have to listen to the devil. You don't have to listen to the fear mongering and the tactics of men. We should stop and consider the source. Consider the sources of the people who are continuing to pump fear into us. Ask yourself this question when someone makes you afraid. Does that person know Jesus? Does that person have any clue about what God would do in my life if I would submit to him? Does that person love Jesus? Does that person love the Bible? Why am I listening to somebody who doesn't love God? Why am I allowing that person to speak their filth into my ears? Why am I letting these people dra uh, drag me into fear and make me hide? Are we listening to men? Are we listening to Goliath, the one who is slandering God? Are we listening to the devil? Isn't it because as I see God's people hiding and among the Midianites sold into slavery, what had happened to those people is they had fallen into sin. And many times that's exactly where we are. It reminds me of Genesis chapter three. You've got all this wonderful stuff going on in the garden. God has placed Adam and Eve there. Adam and Eve are doing great. They love God. They're walking with God. They're enjoying life. They're enjoying each other. And then something happens in Genesis chapter three. You know what happens. Enter the devil. The devil comes in. He starts questioning God. He starts speaking his negativism into their ears. Does God really, did God really say that to you? And he begins to question the word of God and begins to act like this book is not relevant for their lives. He begins to act like whatever God says, you can't trust him. And sure enough, they buy into his, his foolishness and they take of the tree, they disobey God. So the next time God comes into the garden to walk with him, what, where are they? What are they doing? Well, they are hiding and they're ashamed. Shame, fear. This is what happens when I allow sin into my life and it drives a wedge between me and God. And it leaves me powerless. It leaves me afraid. Not where God intended for me. God never intended for me to be there. It was not supposed to be that way. Do you remember when the spies did come into the, the promised land. I'm speaking of the two spies that Joshua sent in just before they went in. And Rahab told the spies in Joshua chapter two, she said, we, we, she said, when we heard the stories about your God and we heard what your God did to the Egyptians, she said, our hearts melted within us. Do you know that Rahab said that and that those accounts about what had happened in Egypt, those accounts were 40 years old. Do you realize that for 40 years, God's people did nothing for God in the wilderness while the Canaanites trembled because whether or not God's people believe the stories, 
the Canaanites believed the stories. They believed the stories of the power of God. And today, God's people, I'm asking you to do the same. I'm asking you to believe the account of God's power in the word of God. I'm asking you to believe this God, that he is able, that he makes you able, that he never intended for you to be disabled, but he intended for you to be used by him. He intended for you to be strong in Jesus Christ, his son. Will you bow your heads with me, please? Father, thank you for the opportunity that you give us to gather around your word together. Thank you for Gideon in the account, Lord, of his valor, of his strength. I thank you that you used him. I thank you, Lord, that he was bothered by the situation. And I thank you, dear God, that you gave him your presence, which is clearly key to conquering any enemy. We thank you for Jesus, the Savior. And Lord, in my hearing right now, I know there are many who have received Jesus Christ. They have Christ. And your word says that greater is he who is in us than he that is in the world. Your word says, Lord, that you will never leave us nor forsake us. Your word says that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And so, Father, I, t I pray that today your people would be able, your people would be strong, that your people would be victorious. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Listen, thank you for being a part of this today. If you meant to get these notes or would love to have future notifications, then you can email us directly at faithtitusville at gmail.com. And we put out an email on Thursdays, for example, of prayer needs that we put out every week. And then also an email on Saturday that'll give you links for our website and it'll give you links for the messages, and it'll also give you a script, for example, of today's notes and a copy of the notes for the, sun, uh, for the weekend message. And if you want these notes directly, you say, you know what, I don't, I'm gonna bypass all of that. I just want a copy of what we talked about today. Then email me directly at pastorcopic at gmail.com and I'd be happy to send you a copy. Listen, we have weekend services on Saturday at 6 p.m. We would love for you to join us here or on Sunday at 9 a.m. or at 11 a.m. And we intend to stream the nine o'clock service. We're social distancing at all of these services. We would so much enjoy to have you come and visit with us at this, that time. God bless you. Be safe as you go.